I want to uh, first uh, introduce uh, Jeff Sherman. Um, Jeff Sherman is our deputy CIO, portfolio manager of many of our strategies, including the, the Double Line Schiller Enhanced CAPE strategy, uh, which I, I'm sure we'll discuss maybe a little bit today. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, um, but uh, he's here to uh, as our deputy CIO to to um, work in the work in the discussion. And then obviously, Dr. Robert Schiller needs no introduction. I will say he is uh, a Sterling professor of economics at Yale. Uh, I believe everyone knows he's a Nobel laureate, as well as an author of many, many books. Uh, the one in the back is his new book out. Uh, I've heard him already on a few shows. It might, might be CNBC or Fox Business, um, uh, uh, talking about his book called Narrative Economics. So we all have a copy of that book in the back. So please take that uh, on your way out. So uh, with that, I just I want to introduce Sam Lau up here. And please join me in welcoming the three. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate the time that uh, you took out of your day to be here with us today. Uh, we are privileged uh, to get this opportunity with uh, Professor Robert Schiller, and we've hosted a number of these conversations in the past, and I've always found them quite insightful. Uh, so the plan of attack today is really to keep it somewhat casual. So as Ron mentioned, if you do have questions along the way, please feel free to you know, chime in. I, I believe there's some microphones that could be passed around to to facilitate that. Um, on top of that, I'd really like to just keep this as a conversation between the, the good professor and, uh, and Jeff Sherman. And I will start it off with a question for Professor Robert Schiller, who has you know, been on the world tier tour for the book uh, Narrative Economics, which just dropped on October 1st of this year. So, Professor, what can you tell us about nar Narrative Economics? OK. <laughs> uh, well, I should start by saying it's something that I define in this book differently than it's been in the past. It used to be rarely used, the term narrative economics, to define economics that's presented as a chronology of history. But I mean something different. I mean by narrative economics, the study of popular narratives. I'm not writing in a narrative form. I'm studying other people's narratives. The idea is that people are storytellers, and you can infer their model of the economy, ordinary people's model, their ideas about what they should be doing from the stories they tell. Most conversations don't take the form of theory, theoretical exposition. So it seems to me it's like the criminologist who went to a prison to interview prisoners about their uh, life and purpose uh, found it difficult to ask them, what is your philosophy of life? Uh, most prisoners don't respond well to a question like that. But if instead you ask them, who's that prisoner over there? What's he in for? Then uh, they respond with great vigor to that. They know everybody's story. And you can listen to the stories and infer what they're, how they view life. That's the idea. Uh, people don't talk much about economics. They talk about personalities, about uh, gossip. Uh, when's the last time you were at a dinner when there were uh, the subject of conversation was, how much should I save for retirement? <laughs> okay. And one person is saying, I think it should be 10%. And another is saying, it should be 8%. You know what? You've probably never heard that even once. People don't t communicate like that. They communicate in stories. So for example, are you maybe aware that there are a lot of stories going around about Donald J. Trump? Have you noticed that? It doesn't depend on which side you are on. You must have noticed that these stories are just everywhere. And they do convey economic, if you listen to them, they convey economic theories. So what I'm saying is that economics should be more focused, and forecasting should be focused on how people think and how it's changing. It's amazing to me that economists have spent so little on trying to understand this. Uh, I mean, that's a good point. And you know, the, the dinner time talk around you know, how much you should save is, is somewhat interesting, because if you translate that to one of more recent phenomena in the financial market, well, if you choose to call it within the financial markets, the Bitcoin narrative and what's surrounding that. And I think you know, in your book, you spend 
some time talking about it, but just you know, the way that you go from the, the three stages, suppose, you know, if you will, of the narratives, the infection, the, is it the contagion, and then the ultimate recovery. Right. Um, around the Thanksgiving t table, we saw an uptick in the levels of Bitcoin you know, right around Thanksgiving time of, what was it, 2018? Um, so you know people around that time were starting oh, to, that to right? spread that I story. Didn't, I didn't even know that. Yeah, it was actually coincided with the launch of the futures on the CME, right, as well. And so there was this very infectious behavior, and it did coincide with the holiday season. There was a big spike in the price of Bitcoin subsequent to that. And um, you know, people just started to tell the story. It's like, what's well, obviously gaining popularity because my grandma was asking about it. And, you know, and we, you know, we had a helping of mashed potatoes that we bought with a Bitcoin or something to that effect. And so you find that uh, you know, what, what happens is that it coincided with the ability to actually short the security, right? Because typically in a Bitcoin account or a cryptocurrency account, and I'm not an expert, it was just a one direction trade. I think there was possible to short it, but it, yeah, it wasn't. It was very difficult yeah. you know, to do so. And um, I think we put together a chart, and so I'll correct you, Lau, I think it was in, 60, it was in 17, I believe, All right. 18. Yeah, and, um, and so we put together a chart for one of the, the presentations we were doing, and we said this, this was eerily reminiscent of what we saw in the uranium market. And I know everybody here trades uranium. You're very familiar, it's a very deep market. But it was a, a market where they were trying to create futures in to try to facilitate you know, just the supply-demand imbalances. And so what happened as soon as they had launched the uranium, for example, it was this exponential function of price, right? And as soon as those futures came out, the price collapsed. And so we said, perhaps that's something that happens in the Bitcoin narrative as well, that uh, people would actually have the ability to go the other direction. And so, um, again, I know there's a lot of folks out there that have very strong opinions about Bitcoin. Um, it's like people with cape ratios, they seem to elicit a lot of, yeah. a lot of passion or a lot of hatred. Uh, but I do think there is something very strong about that, and we seek that. What's the narrative of 2019? Um, I, I would argue that it's the, uh, you know, the, the fake meat Right? That's what everybody's talking about right now. Um, I, I don't know really the f officially plant-based food, I guess Pretend. we call it. Pretend. Vegetables that don't look like vegetables anymore. Yeah, that's a cool, you know, I hardly ever tweet, but I was at a session at the World Economic Forum on fake meat a couple of years ago. And I, I tweeted one line, this is the most interesting thing I've seen at the whole forum. Yeah. And I got a big reaction to that. So I, I just thought it was a cool story and I, had fun with it, but I wasn't right timing because that wasn't uh, the, exactly the moment. But you were ahead of it, so you were ahead of the, of the new trend. But it seems that by the time we hit that infection stage, as you, you call it in the book, you call it the recovery, um, that's when people really start to catch on and most investors actually catch a massive downside, right? They, they believe in the narrative. It's very late to the stage when they, they finally make the investment and it's something to be very careful about and cautious about. Um, because I, I think the, the dinners I attend where people are talking about retirement, and I've had a few over, over my Even lifetime. You stimulate conversation about that. I, I'm going to disagree. It's usually like, how do I get rich quick? Right? I need to retire. Uh, what, you, know, you work in the investing field. I need to double my money every couple months. <laughs> All right. What do you have? And I'm like, well, we got this low duration bond fund, right? You know, um, that, you know, in today's market, it may take, you know, 25, 30 years to get there, but, uh, but no one wants to, a lot, I don't want to say no one, a lot of people don't want to hear that, right? And so I think there is this fascination with the narrative, as you mentioned, because um, a lot of investors want the success very quickly and without risk. That's, yeah. Well, what I'm also emphasizing in the book is that. Uh, we can be more concrete about narratives than we ever could before because we have digitized text and we can search. Uh, so in the past, economists and finance people didn't like to talk about narratives because it seemed too impressionistic, unscientific. But I think we'll have a, a revolution in, in, well, we actually are already seeing an increase in all of the social sciences in attention to narratives. We used to have to content ourselves with much less data. In fact, before 1960, you didn't even have uh, stock price data uh, on, a, you know, on a computer tape that you could uh, process. So we're, we're coming along with more, more and more data. And I think we're going to get to an era in economics and finance when people study what people are thinking. You just have to, don't expect for them to explain their theories to you directly. 
Right. Well, I think finance is one of those fields where it isn't just finance, right? We tap into mathematics, we tap into economics, we tap, tap into social behavior, psychology, and that's a lot of things of what we try to talk to our investors about is psychology too, right? Because it's really easy to look at a back test or it's really easy to look at a fund's performance and say, you know what, I can live through that drawdown, no problem, look at all the money I made, look at that compound annualized return. And then they make their first investment, and then they call you two days later and say, it's down one basis point. What did you do? Right? But there is something about that psychology, because it's easy to look at a spreadsheet. It's easy to look at a chart. And you hear the stories on, on the financial media that say, well, if you'd have put $10,000 in XYZ, you know, you'd have $27 million today. How many of you have ever put $10,000 in something and watched it grow exponentially and never taken a profit off of it? Right? And so they're not real world examples. And so a lot of what we need to teach as well, and I know you do a good job of this at the university, is the psychology of it. What are you comfortable with? What, 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 what can you experience in your portfolio that will allow you to be comfortable and not have to touch it, right? And so I think that those are some of the lessons I think that we learned from this. And I just think that after reading the book and you know, I've seen you kind of present it for the last couple of years, the idea in your presentations is that it really leads into that behavioral side that we're trying to, you know, uh, just trying to control our own emotions when being investors ourselves. Yeah, so this is part of behavioral finance, which is something that started maybe 30 years ago. Th these changes, they, they go viral slowly. Uh, and so it's the same thing with economics. So maybe you can define it viral. Why do we use the phrase viral? Right? It's always, you know, and I, you know, with, you say infectious, it's, it sounds so horrific, right? But why, why are things viral? Uh, that term uh, is not that old, uh, but before that they had other names for it. In the 1890s, some people talked about what they called idea microbes. <laughs> it's an <laughs> idea that they couldn't say virus because they, it wasn't until 1895 that Virenk discovered viruses. They didn't even know they existed. But they knew it was around the microbe. Uh, but they knew microbes. Okay. Uh, so it's, an, it's not an original idea, I, uh, the idea that there would be. Uh, Richard Dawkins called them memes in his book, The Selfish Gene. He said they're like viruses. He didn't actually use the word uh, 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 going viral. Uh, but the idea that contagion drives markets has been kind of around. It just hasn't been researched. Uh, and it hasn't been legitimate. Uh, uh, it, it would be offhanded. People would make offhanded remarks. So, uh, you know, for example, in, in, uh, I, I like to bring up 1929, if I might do, do that. Uh, that is a viral story, uh, but it was itself generated by viral stories that, that preceded it. There were a lot of people before the crash of 1929 who were telling uh, openly, this market is going crazy. It's just getting too high. And, and that was one of the viral stories at that time. And I think it was a self-fulfilling prophecy that generated the 1929 crash. Yeah, as you tell that story, I recall seeing your presentation a couple years ago, and I think you used the example from Black Friday, right, too, in there. Maybe you could oh, tell before that. the Yeah, uh, before the Black Friday crash, or the Black... Okay, well, okay. So, uh, yeah, the, the week before October 28, 1929, saw record drops in the Dow. Now, people weren't used to talking so much about the Dow then. That was kind of a technical index, not very interesting. But records always attract people's attention. And then uh, uh, over the weekend, there, there, there was kind of a fear of what would happen in the coming... On Monday. When yeah, the market on Monday. Uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, market crashed. I, I turned then to uh, church sermons the following Sunday after the crash. And it, it was really a field day for ministers who would give sermon or rabbis uh, about the moral bankruptcy of our country and our nation. Uh, and it quickly turned that this was crazy, this was a speculative, but it was a narrative that had already started and wasn't believed. Uh, and then, it, but it really went viral and so much so that it's still remembered today. We still have this oversimplified story of the decades, that the 20s were, were, were a roaring 20s, 
everyone was fancy free and having fun and the women were wearing scandal scandalously short dresses. Uh, and then there was the depression, which put everyone in a psychological depression. The skirt lengths came down, right? And these are just narratives about that time. That narrative resurfaced in ten, just 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, just around the time of the, of the financial crisis. So we, we, we still remembered that narrative, because it was a very good story quality narrative. It was, uh, and everyone knew what it meant that when there were comparisons with 1929 in, in 2008. Do you think that's some of the fear today when we have discussions about recessions, right? And I know you get quoted on it, they ask us all the time, investors and folks talk to us about it and say, well, what about a recession? What should I do for it? Should I you know, go all to cash? Should I do something like that? And I know in our conversation we've had over the years, you see, recessions are normal. You know, recessions aren't necessarily something to be feared. They're good for cleansing out capitalism at times. But the last two recessions we've experienced in the U.S. have been extremely painful for investors. They've had significant drawdown. And so is it the idea that now it becomes this self-fulfilling idea because we tell ourselves a recession looks like 2008 or a recession looks like 2000, right? And We're so starting to forget 2000, but... Yeah, it's true. True. Well, a lot of investors still uh, weren't around in 2000 nowadays, right? Yeah, my students, yeah, yeah. for example. <laughs> yeah. But what, what do you think about that when you talk about the narratives and, and how they really shape behavior? Is a lot of it just that it's all self-fulfilling, right? Whether they're trends upward or trends to the downside. Yeah, so the idea that uh, stock market movie, movements might be self-fulfilling prophecies was written in an essay by Robert K. Merton, the father of the economist uh, in the 1940s. Uh, it goes back a little further with Roosevelt uh, saying the only thing to fear is fear itself. Uh, but it doesn't uh, go too much further back because they weren't so folk, they, they talked about panics, uh, uh, banking panics, but they didn't talk much about the stock market. And they didn't ever quote indices in, so it just wasn't, now we have talk of indices every day. It's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It's on the banners moving below the screen on CNBC and other places. Uh, so we now have a narrative that uh, attributes magical powers to, to the stock market. Yeah, well, I think usually when on the trading desk, uh, we see the CNBC or the Bloomberg um, uh, financial shows um, that it's like, Oh, fear and panic. Oh, the market is in a crisis. It's down 2% today, right? I mean, and, and there's something that harps on some of that as well. And I guess some of it is the storytelling that we rely on the financial media to entertain us, right? Isn't there some entertainment value behind this as well? Oh, yeah, actually. Well, that's the thing about narratives. They, to be contagious, there has to be someone willing to tell them. Uh, and it, we, we all have this sort of a general consensus that the stock market is very interesting. <laughs> and so it, it's, it becomes part of a constellation of narratives, as they call it, or a co-epidemic. That's a term from epidemiology. Sometimes two diseases will, in, will interact positively. So for example, uh, tuberculosis and HIV uh, tend to occur together because they, they somehow increase the contagion of the other. Uh, and, and so we, we have important narratives that occur in clusters that, uh, that become powerful. And so it's hard for people to understand what's making them powerful. Why is everyone talking about Bitcoin right now? And I would say, it, uh, I'll tell you about Bitcoin, I just moved to Bitcoin. It's new. You moved all your money it, to Bitcoin? <laughs> uh, actually, I, I wouldn't object to putting a little of your money in Bitcoin. But it has to be uh, little, <laughs> okay. Uh, but why is Bitcoin, uh, why did it reach over 300 billion in market cap? Uh, it was, first of all, it was a, a human interest story about Satoshi Nakamoto, who is a supposed inventor. But it's a mystery story because absolutely no one remembers meeting him. So how can this be? How can you start a, a whole industry and nobody has ever met you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, maybe he doesn't exist. There, there's Nakamoto imposters who come up from time to time, and they propel the story further. Uh, it also uh, fits in with uh, an old story that goes back to the early 19th century called anarchism. 
and it's a philosophy that uh, wants to get rid of the government and thinks that somehow we'll manage without a government. Uh, this strikes most people as a stupid idea. How can you possibly not have a government? Uh, and that's been a thorn in the side of the anarchists. So they just love this story about Bitcoin because no government was behind it. And it, it's unregulated. Uh, it's, it's just a beautiful story. And then a third reason why it's contagious is because young people today, especially, are worried about their futures because of another narrative, the automation or artificial intelligence narrative. And they feel that, I wish I could, I wish I could be closer to this uh, artificial intelligence re revolution. I want to do something cool that shows that I'm a, a real with it person. That's why Stanford University number one major, I heard, is computer science. Uh, everywhere we're moving in that direction because people don't feel, they feel lost. So how do we, uh, how do you assuage that fear? One simple thing you can do, it's so easy, you have it done in five minutes. You go on the internet and you search for buy Bitcoin and then you buy, you, you buy one coin or you buy a tenth of one coin and now you're in with this crowd. It's sort of, it, it, you help identify, you feel like I'm one of the prime movers who's who's making, hopefully then I'll make money and I'll watch it go up. I'll watch it every day. Right. Well, it reminds me of, you know, uh, the late 90s. You know, you wrote your book on irrational exuberance. That's what we saw demonstrated within the tech and telecom sector back then. Um, I think it was even on greater display back in the mid 2000s uh, with the housing market, right? We always talk about the envy of the Joneses, right? That your neighbor is in the water ski, keep, keep, keep up with the Joneses, right? You have envy of the neighbor who has a new car or something, um, and you want to cash out refis and, and the things that we did to, to stimulate activity there. But aren't they just really, I think you use the word, they're perennial net narratives, right? right? Isn't it just the same thing over and over again? It's just how do we identify, is this just a narrative that is, you know, I hate to use the word bubble, um, but it's just something that's caught up in this fallacy of, you know, the get rich quick scheme or, just as you said, it's, it's uh, trying to participate in what everybody else is, is speaking about. Yeah, so the, uh, the competing narrative that I describe in one of my chapters in the book is between uh, conspicuous consumption and frugality. So these are two narratives. So the frugality narrative goes back to ancient times in Greece, Rome, China. They had what are called sumptuary laws that forbade people from showing off their wealth too uh, ostentatiously. It was a crime, you couldn't do that. It limited the number of columns you could put on your house, or things like that. Uh, but the other side uh, of, of the narrative is the narrative that uh, you better show off because uh, that's the key to business success. Uh, if, you, if you're too modest, people will assume you're not worth anything. So a, a big exponent of this is our president, Donald Trump, in his book, uh, How to Get Rich, for example. Uh, and in that book, he tells you, don't be afraid of boasting. You know, uh, he, he said that? He said that. Well, I'm not quoting him word to word. He said, it, may, uh, it was something like this. It may annoy some people, but they get the message that you're an important person, so do it. That, it's, that's what the book said. So he set a, a different tone, a different narrative tone. Uh, I think people, uh, when they hear the Trump narrative, they become maybe a little bit more boastful and a little bit more willing to buy a big house. And but isn't it just confidence and, and a lot of it at the end of our economy is built on a lot of confidence because we said the self-fulfilling mechanism, especially when you're a service-based economy, right that you really need to continue the spending and need to have confidence you need to believe in the system now that was a uh, the idea that you should spend that it's not selfish was attempted and promulgated by people in the great depression mm -hmm. but i don't know if it was that powerful a narrative trump does it better than uh, those people did yeah, it's the, the best economy ever. By, by showing he said this is a quote live the story he said, you have to have a story about yourself and then do it. He also says, think big, uh, live large. Uh, and, and he is such a success, at least so far, that it looks, uh, it's inspiring. I think that's part of the reason for the strength in our economy in the last couple of years.
I mean, on the strength of the narrative around Donald Tr J. Trump has also spurned, I think, what you would term the, the counter narratives as well, right? With some of the uh, individuals in the other party coming up with more socialist type of uh, right. platforms. Um, is that something that you can expect going forward? How will that impact this economy that we're talking about that seems to be the greatest economy ever? Well, the, the socialist thing is the wealth tax. Uh, and uh, we got up to something like 8% a year after $50 million of... Yeah, well, you won't be wealthy long eventually, right? <laughs> yeah. Or you want, want to pay it eventually. It well, you better get an 8% return. Right. right. <laughs> we want to pay it, you know, so you just get to 49 and you're good, right? Wouldn't it be horrible to have, make like 50... I guess it's always above the 50s. Never mind. I was just thinking that you get hit for the 8% of the 50... It's, it's the marginal above it. But... Uh, you know, isn't this always the pool, like when you go through history, because I know you, you read a lot of history and you read a lot about cycles, isn't this kind of inherently the pool between economies is that there is this vacillation between extreme capitalism and extreme socialism, and it is somewhat of a sinusoidal wave through the cycle that you, you try to push things to the extreme, um, and then they tend to revert back a little bit in, in that capacity, and so there is some balance between the two. I mean, it seems to me in the circles we travel in, socialism is like a horrible word, right? If you say that, it's like, oh. That's part of the American it's narrative. It's American dynamic, right? right? That it's all about a meritocracy and, you, you know, you'll get ahead by working hard. But isn't there that push and pull between the two factors? Or the two, the two kind of extrema being extreme capitalism and then yeah. extreme socialism? Uh, yes. Uh, the labels, you know, the, the idea of what is a Republican has changed a lot. They used to be pro-free trade, and now they're anti-free trade. So uh, I, I, I don't know what socialism means anymore. Market, they call it market socialism in China today, but they have billionaires and they have <laughs> companies, and uh, it doesn't look that much different. From but is, isn't that just really when we talk about the political system and not to politi politicize the discussion, but isn't that really what we do in the political system? It seems to be, at least in my lifetime, it's that we go one direction and it's like, that's not working, let's go completely the other direction. And that's how we got a Donald J. Trump. And maybe that's how we get you know, the president on the other side next time. But it's this idea that we just so vehemently reject what's going on that we just say, we want to change, we want to do a complete 180, or at least what appears to be. And, and maybe it's just that each election feels that it's the most important election of the lifetime. That's what everybody always says, right? And so maybe we dramatize it, too. Yeah, and we forget how... Another thing about Bitcoin, I, I, I compare it with bimetallism. <laughs> long so he's Bitcoin. long Bitcoin, you can tell. No, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to compare it with bimetallism in the please, 1890s. Please You've completely forgotten about, but none of us was alive then. But it looks surprisingly like Bitcoin. It was a proposal to change from the gold standard to a gold and silver standard, which was predicted to cause inflation of about 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this, if you read the newspapers of the time, it was these crazy young people, from, especially, uh, uh, it seemed to be a conflict regionally between the East Coast finance people and the, the, the middle, uh, middle West. I don't hear much about California, but uh, they must have been I don't know which side they were on. It was, and they, they were, were gold miners, I think. Right? The 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 the, uh, uh, the Eastern intellectuals, who tended to be educated people, said this is absolutely a crime of the first order because if you suddenly double the price level, it's cutting all fixed incomes exactly in half. Uh, it's just pure theft because we had defined the contract in terms of gold. Uh, and uh, this is just the stupidest idea, and it will totally ruin the country. So the 1896 election was an election over bimetallism, and people thought that it will be the end of the world if William Jennings Bryan uh, is elected. It will be the worst disaster. So business stopped because people didn't, uh, they didn't believe the future was, they had to see this resolved. Fortunately, William Jennings Bryan lost, and we stayed on the gold standard. Although we eventually went off. <laughs> Tell Bretton Woods. But you, you mentioned that too, because I, I think it's interesting. You, you bring up Bitcoin, and then you talk about the gold center and bimetallism. But why is gold gold, right? It's like we attach this affinity to it. And I, I heard the story, you know, once is, um, you know, it's obviously the biblical sense. But 
whatever happened to Muir and Frankincense, these things that were supposedly so valuable? I don't even know what those are, by the way. I've just heard the words. But um, why is it gold, right? Why, why gold? Like, why is that the narrative? Why is that the storage of value? Well, it is in partly narrative dynamics. Yeah. The term, go I counted the Bible. The word gold appears over 300 times in the Bible. So it has some kind of sacred quality. Well, how many times are frankincense in there? <laughs> not, not that many yeah. times. Okay. Okay. But there's your I, answer. I think it's probably like five times. <laughs> and frankincense. But that's a good point. So someone was asking uh, Ben Bernanke. I think it was uh, Rand Paul. Ben, yeah. uh, was asking him, why does the Fed Reserve still own gold? Uh, the dollar isn't backed by gold anymore. And uh, Bernanke answered, uh, it's just tradition. But I think the reason they do it is they know that there's a narrative still. Some people think we're still on the gold standard. Right. And, you know, That's what, didn't they want to go into Fort Knox and see the gold, right? Because it's like, well, if we have all these dollars in print, there's not enough gold in Fort Knox, then yeah. it's not worth it. But it's, it's not even, they're not even linked outside of obviously an exchange and we can exchange them in financial markets. I just think if they sold the gold, that would be a quick source of revenue. But it would just lose the mystique of this. It, it's just such a powerful narrative. Question, would, as an audience here, so we'll make you participate. If the Federal Reserve sold all of its gold, is that bullish or bearish for gold? So how many bulls we got on that? Does the price of gold go up under that scenario? OK, price go down? Supply and demand yeah. rules, right? Right. That's the narrative, at least, right? Yeah. So you have a well. Your your audience is not typical of my audience for <laughs> for my <black> book. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the, the ordinary randomly selected person would say. Today. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting. You know, there was not a single hand for. Saying One guy kind of did. He, he, he didn't want to stand out. Was that? Right? He was, yeah. well, you, no, you that, just called him out. Don't call him out. <laughs> so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and bring us back to the present. Um, the IMF recently downgraded global growth. Professor Schiller, I want you to put your professor hat on. U.S. economy is one of your students. Assign a grade, a report card, if you will. Tell the economy where it's, where it's strengths are and uh, what, do what, what horizon uh, let's say for the, through the end of 2020 that's just a little over a year uh, so I, I as a statistician I'll say it'll be doing about the same <laughs> as it did this year so it's something like 2.5 percent but there is a chance there is a chance of a reset so I've been saying it's under 50 percent uh, that's not based on any uh, calculated model. It's just based on my sense of the animal spirits that I'm hearing. But it also depends on this impeachment inquiry and what stirred up there. Uh, I, I think that, uh, the, the chance of, of, a, of a recession, yeah, is uh, under 50%, but close to. The reason I say under Does 50. Does the impeachment increase or decrease the probability? I, I'm just saying we don't even know what's happening. There, right. uh, there could be other news stories that are general. It's a, it's a time of great anger. Mm -hmm. uh, and we haven't seen times like this so often. Uh, so, so anger creates divisiveness, it creates uncertainty, and then perhaps creates you know, the lack of investment or something. It's also like people. Uh, accusing everyone else of lying, uh, and that th that is a fundamental dismissal of someone's human worth. Using the word lie, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it also creates uncertainty. Like if you think everyone's lying, how can I do business? Uh, so it is a little bit like I, 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 I'm going back to 1896. William Jennings Bryan caused a, a, a depression. Uh, at that time, business people were interviewed by newspapers, and they said, I just can't do business now uh, because I don't know what the money is worth. And they didn't know about indexing or uh, some other kind of contract. They just stopped. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you talked about before was the, uh, the Donald J. Trump narrative and the baller lifestyle. Um, yeah, you, you go with that and just, you know, whether or not the U.S. consumers, the ones who watch and read the Twitter, you know, if they'll continue living that lifestyle and continue to spend, or if there will be the self-fulfilling prophecy or self-fulfillment of 
you know, some of the, the narratives that we started to see around you know, the fact that we talked about earlier, the longest uh, economic expansion ever by now, by two quarters beyond what we had in history. Yeah, yeah. You've got a, you know, negative yields, you, have an inver you had an inverted yield curve you know, uh, for, for some time there. Although uh, not today, uh, if you're looking at it through different points within the Treasury, but if you still look at it against the, the Fed funds rate, it's still inverted. So these are things that you know, point to a possible recession coming Right, forward. not necessarily in, by the election, Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, I think the thing about it is, is that we all have been told the story and backed up with the anecdotal evidence that yield curve inversions have historically led to recessions. Now, they don't always lead to recessions, but almost every recession has a yield curve inversion in front of it, to which begs the question, is this the most telegraphed recession ever? I think I lost my microphone there. Uh, is this the most telegraphed re recession ever, or are we just all ahead of it now? We're all so smart and we know everything. And I think, you know, I, I don't think either of those are correct, you know. But at the end of it, when you're talking about the economy, um, you know, there are great bright spots. I, I can make you a bearish case with data today. I can live the baller lifestyle with my microphone now. Um, I like how you use that baller lifestyle. Oh, I thought that was very good. Uh, which I'm going to totally tangentially take this because I, when we did a podcast with Josh Brown, we did a couple years ago, and I asked him the question about why are rappers infatuated, he loves rap music, why are rappers infatuated with Donald Trump? And he said, it's the ostentatious, it's the boisterous style which is embedded in the music. And we just had this very long discussion about it, it was very interesting, but at least to me it was. But what, ultimately what we're talking about here is people finding data points that support their opinion. It's that reinforcement, it's that confirmation bias that's inherent in people looking for reasons to want to believe their own made up narrative, right? And so when you look at the economy today, um, is it the best economy ever? No. Is it the worst economy ever? No. And guess what, as you just said, we've been growing at two and a half percent this year, right? Two and a half percent is slightly above trend since the crisis. And is that a bad thing? But the difference is, is that the markets are, are connoting one thing. Um, the, you talk about the yield curve. It, yield curve kind of says it looks a little recessionary, that it's elevated. What does the stock market tell you? Is it pricing in an elevated recession risk today? No. What does the credit market tell you? It's not. And I ask, what's the commodity market telling you? Kind of what it always tells you, eh, right? That's because of the trade, the trade conflict. So I, I think the, the question becomes, People are keep asking us, recession probability, recession probability, what do I do? Well, you, you kind of think about it is that you need the diversification. You need to have something to weather the storm. And I think you've always been an advocate of not trying to time the market, right, but to try to rotate in things that have more attractive valuation. So um, maybe put it in the context of the CAPE ratio since uh, you're here today. What is your most recent calculation of the CAPE ratio tell you? And um, what does that imply to investors out there today? Well, the overall CAPE ratio for the United States is around 29. Uh, for Europe, it's 21. Uh, and so I think uh, I have higher expectations for Europe than the US. So explain to the folks in the audience today, what does a CAPE ratio of 29 mean to you? What is, when you see that, what does that mean? Does that mean I should sell all my stocks? What does it mean in terms of valuation and how you use the CAPE ratio to assess forward-looking returns? Uh, yeah, so with a CAPE ratio of 29, it's only happened a few times in history. Uh, it, 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 we got up to the mid-30s in 1929, so that was a record. They didn't talk about, well actually they did a little bit about CAPE, they didn't call it a CAPE ratio. I found a 1911 Wall Street Journal article that talked about it for railroads. And they, uh, they, they said we should average the earnings over a longer period of time. Uh, so what does it mean? Uh, and then it was higher in, uh, it went up to 45 in the year 2000. Uh, it wasn't up, uh, it's higher than it was in, 2000, uh, in 1987, the biggest one day drop. People thought the market was highly priced then. I, I did a survey then, but they, it didn't, uh, it didn't, uh, it didn't register that much on the Cape. So uh, the other t in 2007, it was uh, around this level. I, I, 
just before the uh, other crash. And now we're here today. So the history uh, shows that it could go up to 45. It's just what it did 20 years ago. Uh, or it could do what it did 20 years ago and lose half its value. But the sample size is very small. Uh, that's the fundamental thing about history. If you define them precisely enough, every circumstance is unique. Uh, and so uh, we can't be scient rigidly scientific about this. Economics is not an exact science. But the, what uh, economists like to do is get the number of observations up by talking about short-term events. Right. So you, but these are typically not important events. They don't get people's attention, so the mechanism isn't the same. I, I've always heard from a statistical standpoint, there's only one sample, there's only one data point, because we've only lived one path. Unless you go to another parallel universe. Yeah. <laughs> All right, maybe we can talk about that a little later. So we uh, started down the, the path of valuations in equities. You know, Sherman, you're up here, man. Tell us what you're thinking about uh, fixed income valuations there. I mean, they're not cheap either, right? Um, when we look at cross markets, um, the, the bond market is not cheap in any capacity uh, by many measures. I think the, the way people I hear saying the treasuries are cheap is that they say, look at Europe, look at negative yielding bonds, we're going negative. Um, I'm skeptical that the U.S. economy, or the, that the U.S. will actually have negative yields, let's say, on the back end of the curve. And, you know, I, I'll give kudos to Jim Bianco for the conversation I had about this. And at the end of it, you know, there, we have negative yields in Japan, we have negative yields in Europe. So guess what? Capital can flow to a high quality asset, right? And so the U.S. economy is thought of one of those bastion of safety, and therefore it, it, it can crave that capital. What happens if Japan is negative, Europe is negative, and also the U.S. has negative yields? Where does the capital go, right? What, name the high quality um, sovereign entities where you can place that. So my first one, Singapore, right? Well, that, they're they're going to take, you know, Switzerland, yeah, 30 negative. Sorry, you don't get positive yield there. Um, where do you go? And guess what? Who can take the amount of capital this economy can? So I think it's very difficult for the U.S. to have negative yields, at least for the prolonged periods like we've seen in Japan and Europe. Doesn't mean it can't happen. Um, but I think it destroys the financial system, the banking system, because it is detrimental to pension plans. It's detrimental uh, to insurance companies. It's obviously detrimental to running a bond business over a long term, right? So maybe, maybe I have the ostrich effect there and I don't want to think about it. But when I look at the economy today, as you said, we're growing. I think if you throw a third quarter in there, it looks like we're probably 2.3 on a year-to-date basis or so, 2.4 on a real. Inflation's there. Uh, absent what the Fed, you know, their measure of core PC, core <laughs> CPI is what, 2.4 we've seen in the chart book we're looking at today. Um, on top of that, uh, the headline number will creep up because the base effects of oil um, will, will uh, go towards not a drag on CPI. So that means we have a nominal GDP you know, somewhere in the 4.5% range. And here we sit and look at a 175 10 year today. Right? And the reason I'm given by every single person to sit across the table with is that it's a lot better than buying the negative 40 basis point boon. That's not a good reason to buy something. It's better than the other thing, and I don't like it. But the other thing about it is, is that the corporate credit markets have absorbed all this capital because people are saying, I need yield. I need return potential. So we did a review with a client yesterday, and they are, have a very long term. They run a, a benchmark is the long duration credit index. So this is something that scare the heck out of you if you hate interest rate risk. It has a duration around 14 years. Does anyone know what that's up year to date? The answer is 23%. Better than the S&P 500. Why? You had the rate tailwind, you had spread compression, and by the way, the, the calendar year turned right at the bottom in markets practically, right? So what we look at when we look at, across this is the value in a lot of these asset classes just doesn't look very attractive from a prospective return. That's one thing we know about valuation is that when you have strong returns, you're taking some of that away from the future, right? So we either need to grow into it, right? Or we just have to accept that we got a return this year and it's gonna be painful for a couple of years. So it um, doesn't mean we hate fixed income, right? You just have to be careful. The curve's flat. You gotta be careful with your duration risk. And look, let's buy stuff other people aren't buying, right? Uh, let's do things that are, you know, still had positive rates of return, but 
You know, maybe their securities are backed by corporate buildings like this, like commercial real estate. Uh, maybe they're in residential. Maybe they're asset backed things. So that's what we've had a heavy tilt for this year. And guess what? We're not being rewarded for it. But the good news is, if we have a reversal in credit, those securities shouldn't drop in value near as much as some of these other things. So it's a long winded say, long winded way of saying it depends. It's tricky. Um, but you have to still do the work at the end of it. And so there's no free lunch out there. And there's nothing really screamingly cheap out there um, unless, uh, unless the dynamics change significantly. I'm reminded of the student debt crisis. And this is partly driven, I think, by the same phenomenon. Uh, all these assets look overpriced. So now is the time to invest in human capital. Right. And they believe that, the, that they get an MBA or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and they believe that that is going to be a winner as an investment. Uh, unfortunately, as a teacher of these people, I, I, I don't know if it's going to be a dramatic winner anymore either. So uh, it, it's the same problem. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting you mentioned student loans because we hear that from a lot of investors. I've heard about the size of student loan market and it's over a trillion dollars. These people are so indebted and it's going to cause a systemic crisis. And it's just like the housing market in 06 or you know, auto, subprime automobiles are going to be the next crisis. And people forget about the magnitude of some of these things, right? And also the inability to get out of the debt, unless you know, we have a bunch of uh, billionaires coming into graduation ceremonies and forgiving everyone's debt, uh, which actually works for an investor, by the way, you get paid off. Uh, by, by the government. By the government, of course. Who else was going to pay for it? The government should pay for everything, right? So I, I think what we have is this, we, in our minds, we want to draw parallels to things. And so we see this a lot of time is that subprime is the, uh, subprime auto. Oh, it says subprime. That must be just like the housing market. Guess what? When you're subprime, you default. I call you a serial defaulter. Now it could be because of your situation. It doesn't mean you intended to, but to have a subprime credit rating, you have missed some bills. You know what that's called? It's called credit research. Right? You need to do the, you got to do the work underneath it, right? And so I, I think we, you mentioned the student loans, and we hear it all the time, but a lot of the student loans are for the higher education, it's people who are employed, and unfortunately, they're the ones making the payments. They're good for investors, but th these, I think everybody's looking for the next smoking gun. I think I, I recall in the last few years when we've traveled together, people always ask you about bubbles, right? So I think of bubbles as a narrative one, but do you see any bubbles in the world today? Uh, I see uh, bubbles everywhere. <laughs> Maybe that's my occupational hazard. <laughs> in the so stock market, in the housing market, yeah. in the bond market. Yep. Uh, so what happens if there's a bubble everywhere? What's an investor to do? Uh, well, see now, yeah, we've th thought about that uh, uh, in terms of uh, an equilibrium model. Yeah. There's no place to go. Yeah. You just have to ride it out. You, you invest, even though you expect the price to decline. Uh, you know, you can imagine it even in a situation where you know it's going to decline, but uh, you still sa you save enough to hold you over. You have no choice. Wait, wait. So you have to actually save money? <laughs> yes. Uh, I have to work this. I, I need a blackboard and chalk to work this out. <laughs> okay. But this is the uh, so-called Lucas model in uh, um, uh, the theory was that the great the, the, the peak in 1929 was caused by people expecting the Great Depression. And so everyone said, I'm not uh, advocating this theory, but it's the Lucas theory uh, made reductio ad absurdum. Uh, everyone says the Depression is coming, I better save. But then they figure out, of course, everyone's going to try to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's going to bid up the price. And it's, you know it's going to fall, but you do it anyway. That's not what happened in the Great Depression, I'll tell you. It's a, it's a story. It's an interesting story. You should read it if you haven't read it. I have not. I have not. So now we all have some homework to do. So he won the Nobel Prize, too. We, we value these things in academia. I um, have to say that was probably the scariest thing I've ever heard. It's like I see bubbles everywhere. And it's almost like the sixth sense. You know, you're that little boy that sees dead people everywhere. But um, or, Sam you know, or Sam Darnold, right? Isn't that what Darnold was saying in the football game last night? <laughs> right. So I see bubbles everywhere. I'm going to remember that one. Um, 
what we're getting up to the hour mark, and I uh, appreciate the time and the conversation up here. But Professor Schiller, you know, I'm not. We can't let you leave without a round of Sherman says. Um, I'm not good at this, by the way. This is your second time today, so it's uh, it's going to be an improvement I, I see coming. So for those of you in the audience, if you're not aware, we have this um, podcast called the Sherman Show, and on it we have what Sherman claims to be my favorite segment on there. Part of the part of the show is Sherman says, where I ask or I provide a series of prompts to the guests and they provide a top of mind response. So we're going to start it out with Mr. Sherman and QE4. Soon, not yet. It's not QE, because they told us it's not QE, right? That's the narrative, it's not QE, and actually I don't think it is, because you're just doing repo facility, you're trying to project liquidity, that's the Fed's job. I don't think it's QE, but it's slippery slope, Eventually, they stopped buying, you know, as they did it, they went from overnight repo to one week to 14 days to now it's three months. One day it'll be 30 years or the 50 years will eventually issue. So it will happen, uh, I do believe, and it will be the tool, the favorite tool of the Fed to avoid negative interest rates in the next recession. Professor Schiller, U.S. housing market. It's 2005 again. Already on that, for another that, year, that, right? That, that, wasn't, that was a top of the mind response. That's, That's what it's supposed to be. That's yeah. right. 2005 was when they first started thinking it was a bubble. And it slowed, the appreciation slowed down. That's what it's doing right now. Yeah. Where is your, uh, your Case Schiller index saying for nationwide right now? What was the year over year growth rate? Uh, it's been coming down. It had been over 10% a year. And now it's down to about three. I don't actually remember exactly. I want to say 3.2. Uh, I think I looked at it. Pretty yeah. good. That's pretty good. Sherman, unicorns. Beautiful. <laughs> Professor Schiller. Yep. You got some add-ons? I don't know anything about VC. I mean, okay. Yeah, all, right. all right. Professor Schiller, wealth gap. Oh, this is inequality you're asking about. Uh, oh. Um, that's such a long-standing issue. It motivated the communists. Thomas Paine wrote a book about it in the 1790s. Henry George wrote Progress and Poverty about that in the 1870s. And I think it's the source of our problems today that people, f uh, uh, and uh, I'm going on, this is too long. Right? Keep going, keep going. Uh, you got a captive audience. We, we had uh, free trade was a, fundamental premise ever since Adam Smith. Uh, and so our way of dealing with inequality was to tax the rich mm -hmm. and give it to the poor. But we're discovering that the uh, poor don't want a handout. They want to work and have self-respect. And something is happening that is diminishing them. It's either globalization or auto automatic artificial intelligence. Yeah. And that is really the... Uh, the scary story of our time. You know, I'm going I'm to piggyback on that because you mentioned about poor not wanting the handout, and it comes back to the meritocracy. And I think that's one thing I look at when I see the, the soybean tariffs and you know uh, the administration providing you know subsidies in the in the interim while we're having this trade conflict, and they keep providing subsidies, and then there's the promise that they're going to buy the Chinese will buy these soybeans, but at the end of it, the farmers want to farm. They don't want the subsidy, right? There's something about it too that's built into the mantra that, you know, this, this, to me this gets into the mind of economic equivalence. You're you're the same off and from an economic standpoint or an income standpoint. However, you don't feel that you're being valued. Right? Yeah, farming has a long history. Is there any farmer here? Anyone ever been a farmer? You have. Okay. Yes. Uh, th do you tell me if this is right? There's a certain poetic majesty to that prof profession. Yeah, the farming community is very tight-knit, I'll just say that. And they have passion for growing what they're growing. Yeah, it's something down-to-earth and real and it's beautiful. really down-to-earth, yeah. Right, yeah, right? <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm getting bad. Go ahead. You did it too? Yeah. yeah. You're no, a f no, 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 not at all. You, you don't like my jokes is what you said. Oh, your jokes yeah. are bad. Okay, okay, good, thank you. You can stay. All right, go ahead. That might be hashtag fake news, Bob. <laughs> um, where are we at here? Global trade. Uh, diminishing. 
Professor Schiller, fist bumping. <laughs> he came up to me and, you know what fist bumping is? You shouldn't be shaking hands. I, I'll present this. You do, here, I do a fist bump. Oh, okay. that's, oh. a, that's a macho sort of uh, greeting. And the point is you didn't touch fingertips, because that's when you rub your eyes and you catch the whatever illness the other person had. <laughs> Yeah, so, I can't remember as long as you don't have knuckle, knuckle germs, you're okay. And you saw, <laughs> now people don't do that because it's not modeled. And so you feel embarrassed suggesting. Uh, but a lot of ideas are like that. People just don't want them unless they see other people doing it. So why don't we start a new narrative here today. Let's all start fist bumping. And it will actually improve the health of the world. All right, so during cocktail hour, no shaking hands, only fist bumps allowed. Yeah, I'm all for it. <laughs> if you don't know Sam very well, he is a germaphobe, so this yeah. really fits into his own narrative as well. Uh, I, I can't remember, but it was years ago. I can't remember who was sick, you or me or maybe Lawrence, uh, but I heard that and just wanted the fist bump, so there we go. Um, Brexit, deal or no deal? Who is that directed to? Sherman. I feel like a game show. Um, <laughs> deal. Negative yields, U.S. Professor Schiller. Uh, the narrative of the new normal. Pure delecto. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Pierre delecto. It's a handle for a specific individual. Uh, I'm not into the. I'm not into this one. Huh? Dang it. <laughs> I've been with you all day. I don't. I didn't get the tweeter today. It's. it's uh, Mitt Romney. Mitt, Mitt Romney. Is that the George Bush Mitt Romney hybrid? So he could go uh, troll himself and like his own comments and the pun. Well, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. that's awesome. What was the what was the other guy's Carlos name? Carlos Danger. Carlos, you knew where exactly where I was going. All right, um, go Pierre. I don't speak French, so I just don't know. <laughs> Professor Schiller, favorite sandwich. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, something oriental, or, uh, or something with hot harissa sauce, hot sauce, harissa that's not oriental, that's uh, Middle East. Mediterranean? Huh? Mediterranean? Is yeah, it maybe a hummus and harissa sandwich. We have to be careful in case there's any um, Barclays people here, because you'll always get harissa based sandwiches from now on, and I know you like it, so. Um, <laughs> I, I, was just like I don't know if I want them for, from now on. <laughs> We obviously uh, spend a lot of time together. We know each other fairly well, so there's a little bit of uh, insight here. The next one, uh, and the final one for each one of you, last movie watched in the theater, Sherman. It was that space movie thing. Um, Star Wars. It was not Star Wars. I, oh, don't get me started. Um, it was the one where What's that? No, the, the lady went into space and almost died and flew out there. George Clooney died. And, and this lady sat in the theater and crinkled paper during this whole movie that's supposed to be in space. Very annoying. I have not been back to the movie since. And I can't remember the name of the movie. Gravity. There you go. Yeah. All right. And the last one to finish it off is Pet Peeve. Pet Peeve. I'm not very... Peevish, per I, I, right? Have you ever seen me acting annoyed? No, no, you're usually just very inquisitive. You're not annoyed. Uh, yeah. and especially so dealing with us. You've been very inquisitive and not annoyed. <laughs> I, I, still, I still got annoyed the other day when I was filling out a, a recommendation form or something online for a student. And it said I waited too long and it erased everything that I entered already. <laughs> that really annoyed me, right? That's worthy of that annoyance. So thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you for tolerating this little uh, interaction here. But before we uh, dismiss, uh, are there some questions out there? You have a Nobel laureate here, you have an author of a book here, and we have Sam. So feel free to shoot on any questions you may have. Yes, sir. Um, we do have a microphone a mic. coming back on here. Is there a narrative, you know, for example, in year 2000, kind of the, why the Schiller Index got so high was the narrative was because of the internet, we may not have a recession again. And, 
Yeah, Have you heard about the 2000 recession, 2001 recession? In the 2000, I think the, the narrative uh, perhaps was that the internet is here right. and that there may not be another recession again and growth will last forever and that's why the valuations were so high possibly was the narrative then. And then obviously in the real estate market, people thought the narrative was real estate only goes up. And right. And, um, and as you mentioned, in 2017 with the Bitcoin, everybody was talking about Bitcoin at Thanksgiving. Uh, is there something, you know, so you've got these extreme narratives. Is there something today um, oh. that is any sort of extreme narrative that you see that is getting to those levels or approaching those levels? Well, uh, the extreme narrative I see today is the artificial intelligence narrative. Uh, and you might think that that would be boosting the stock market uh, uh, because a lot of us humans feel inadequate and we want to buy into, especially the tech sector, we want to buy into something cool and glamorous and uh, with the times. Uh, maybe, yeah, so, uh, but it doesn't seem to be having as much of an effect as I would have thought. Uh, I'm thinking it may yet. So. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that I feel like the negative interest rate policy sounds like a, a, one of these narratives that's caught on. And it's amazing to see as we hit the peak uh, in market value of negative yielding sovereign bonds. And in fact, corporate bonds were over a trillion dollars uh, equivalent in terms of negative yielding over the course of the summer. And you saw the dearth of research reports come out and say, it makes sense. Does it make sense? Or are you just rationalize it? And I heard the idea, it's a wealth tax. Well, no, I actually, I'm sorry. I care about the idea it's a wealth tax. I heard that, oh, there's too much as a glut of savings. I think it's a wealth tax at the end of it because the savers have the money. Yeah, the pensioners really don't have the money, but that, that's part of it. So I, I think that these things do catch on and they catch on late. And I feel like we're gonna, we're gonna look back, and I don't know when, when this will be, but we're gonna look back in three to five years and go, what the heck were we thinking in 2019? Why did we think this was gonna work? And it will break when it breaks, and it'll break when we push it too far, right? And I think you've seen some of the limits of that. With you know, someone mentioned Switzerland earlier. Switzerland having a two-year yield at negative 115 basis points a few months ago, it's just crazy, right? You are alternatives. You have other choices, and you all have a business out yeah, there. Yeah, is run. it crazy, or they're just uh, they're just not thinking? They're not paying attention? Or you're making money on it? Don't forget, if you bought negative yielding bonds at the beginning of the year, you made money on the trade. But you only make money if, you, if the price continues to go up, very obvious, which means yields have to go more negative. The only way to make money on a negative yielding bond position is to buy it and sell it to someone else at a later time at a lower yield. Because if you hold it to maturity, guess what? This is a compliance friendly statement. I see my CCO in here somewhere. You are guaranteed to lose money. I think I can say that. Okay, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll stop. Hi, um, Lauren from you too from the LA Times. I'm actually not writing a story about this, so <laughs> just here to observe. But I'm curious about something. Uh, and I haven't read your book, so I apologize if you address this in the book. But what do you think about the role of social media in terms of exacerbating any of these you know, economic narratives that you talk about? Because obviously that's a, a new phenomenon that's had an effect of all sorts of right. you know, elements of society. Well, in my books, I've talked about innovations in communications that caused market volatility. So the uh, first one was the invention of the newspaper. <laughs> that goes back long before the LA Times to the 1610s in Netherlands. And then we had the tulip mania. Uh, it wasn't just newspaper, it was broadsides and pamphlets. I think that they're related, probably. Uh, and then when the invention of the telephone in 1876 eventually led to m mass marketing uh, of stocks in the 1920s when it really caught on. So changes in communication technology have in the past seemingly had, although you can't prove it, but they seemingly had an impact on bubbles. And uh, on the other hand, things can communicate pretty fast without newspapers. I mean, you can actually, uh, epidemics of diseases are not spread by newspapers uh, or radio or te telephone, just human, human's interaction. So things can go fast enough uh, without any communications media uh, intervention. But it, I, I think it does change the nature of, of our communications and changes the nature of narratives. 
Uh, it allows for more f narratives that are interesting and appealing to minority groups. You can reach them better. You could, uh, 50 or 100 years ago, subscribe to a communist newspaper or the like, and you would hear from them. But it wouldn't be the two-way communication that we can get on the internet. And we have so many more different possible uh, special crazy uh, <laughs> groups. Uh, and they now have, uh, now that things can spread within that group. So there are concerns. And I'm actually worried a lot about what will happen as social media expand even further and are more uh, uh, addictive than they are now. We have a question up front here. Yeah. Tomorrow is the 90th anniversary of Black Thursday. The 90th anniversary. The 90th anniversary of Black Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. Since World War II, as you bought at the top of 40% make of bus, in order to five years to get your money back. Why is it so much faster for the market to adjust to a pulpy story? Why is it so much faster? Why is it so much faster? Why is the market Saying why is the, re why is the recovery faster? Why, why is the recovery in the market? It's taking less time to recoup those losses. Uh, and it, uh, uh, okay, I'm not, I haven't thought about this particular uh, regularity. Uh, he addressed it to you, so I'm not going to comment. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, you're saying that there's a general rule that market, sharp market drops have recovered faster than they since World War II, they recovered from deep, deep uh, crashes of 40% okay. greater in five years. Uh, well, one thing is, uh, if you're talking in nominal terms, we've had much more inflation over much of this period. That comes to mind. Uh, there's a money illusion, too, that people generally don't appreciate that they might expect history to repeat. You're not talking in real terms. No. In five years, inflation was really big uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I've actually been interested in, uh, I have confidence, it's stock market confidence indices that I've been collecting uh, for about 30 years. No one pays any attention to them, but I keep doing it. I have a, what's called a buy on dips index, which goes back to late 80s, I think. Uh, so the question I ask of uh, both individual and institutional investors is, if the Dow were to drop 3% tomorrow, what do you think it would do the next day? And I had the choices are go up, go down, or stay the same. And so I have that index. So you can see it's on my website. I'm just giving it away. Yeah. Uh, and it, jump, it oscillates around a lot. Uh, uh, it's, I haven't been able to make any sense out of it. Uh, so it seems like people do changes in your belief that a buy on dips is a good strategy are rather high frequency. I, I, say, I don't know about this thing about, uh, I don't go back to uh, World War II on this. Uh, so I don't know, maybe there is an uptrend on belief in buy on dip. If, if people there really believed that it would go up yeah. immediately. But, but there's the memes that took place after 2010 that were called by the dip, right? They may have said something slightly different, but the idea behind it was that, you know, because the Fed will inject, there's this belief that, you know, there is the backstop and, you know, it was called the Greenspan put in the 90s and... Well, that was a theory about the Fed. Right, right. right. Because in 1987, Greenspan bailed out the, uh, the market. The market, right. Yeah. So, so it might associate with, with a Greenspan narrative. Right. And that's the, where we fell in love with central bankers, right? He was the maestro. There was the narrative about the... He that was a best-selling book, oh, maestro. 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 Maestro, right, yeah. So, anyway, do you have anything else? Okay, go ahead. Can I ask a question about um, expansions? Do you see them, towards both of you, do you see any more of like normalization and um, this time is different? Can we have more longer expansions? Uh, it's been getting longer. If you look at the, uh, you do a search on NBER recession dates, and a page will come up, it goes back to 1854. Uh, there was a long expansion between 1873 and 79. That was six years. But this one is 10 years and, and still going. So why is that? <laughs> there must be some narrative, uh, but it's partly just the narrative of the other expansions. We've had longer expansions 
in the 90s and uh, yeah before. I think the, the counterpoint to that is that although it's been the longest in tenor or you know the time length it's been not as pronounced in terms of aggregate growth right and so some people have said that it's kind of a function of growth not the time uh, that it takes to grow there I, I don't know I mean it's hard, it's hard to really pinpoint any of that. I agree with you there, but long, some ex it, long expansions tend to be slow growth. Period. Correct. Right. So it's because like you don't get the boom bust, trend. right? You don't get the cyclicality of the boom bust, right? And that's typically typically what ends a, a, a big growth period is that you get over leverage, you know, over expansion. People get new businesses, and it ends up being you know essentially over your skis, right? And that's typically what turns a market from a growth market to a contraction. And it's malinvestment, typically. So maybe bond yields being lower has helped kind of prolong this and propagate this. I mean, it's it's a it's a multi-factor world that we're trying to boil down and distill down to one idea. So I have another one in the back. Yeah. One more question, for, uh, Professor Schiller, in response to your okay, vision there. of bubbles, yeah. can you elaborate on maybe the top three bubbles and how dramatic you imagine? In maybe? what in history? Well, where we are now, and then maybe in contrast, also highlight three or two opportunities that you think may actually exist. Oh, bubbles now. I was going to refer you to the 1720 Mississippi bubble, but that's not <laughs> what, you want, what you wanted to hear about. How many the people have ever heard of that one? You've heard of the Mississippi yeah. bubble. That is the, that is the bubble where the term was coined in French, boule. That was number, the first bubble, and it was a remarkable. We have a book about it. That uh, Will Getzman at uh, our Yale School of Management. I, it's, I recommend it. It's an interesting time, but it's kind of remote. But it kind of reminds you how similar people are. But you want bubbles right now that you can short. I don't necessarily want that. <laughs> yeah. I'm just interested to hear your comments about maybe where you see the top three and how yeah. they could be. Uh, so I've, I've been thinking about this, and it's kind of hard. It takes me longer to research. I think you were right about short, the, the bond market boom is unsustainable. Yeah. And it, it seems to be related to people not paying enough attention and thinking through the simple logic that you explained about this can't keep going, and it's got to end badly. Uh, th these things may sink in at some point. So the bond market bubble. The housing uh, bubble, uh, especially in Canada, any Canadians here? <laughs> uh, but in, or, or Australia. Yeah. Uh, but it's been going up. Now San Francisco, uh, LA are slowing down. According to, I have the Case-Shiller home price indices. And I think that that's a bad indicator. If they've been going up for years and they start to slow down, that's why I said it's like 2005 again. So, but I don't. Uh, I haven't been very aggressive in making bearish forecasts. Uh, it doesn't seem as excited a, bu a bubble as it was in 2003 or 2004, uh, because maybe we're a little chastened by memory that home prices really do fall, and so we're not quite as exuberant now. So I'm not sure it's a repeat performance. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions, and then afterwards we have cocktail hour too, where you can fist bump with. <laughs> uh, both Professor Schiller and uh, Jeff Sherman. So, yes, thanks for uh, this presentation. Very interesting. One of the other bubbles that I want to ask about, since you brought up the idea of the negative bond yields going on, is the, the bubble of government debt. <laughs> and it seems like with uh, the deficits we have been running now, and seemingly now people in power are just writing checks like there's no bottom. It used to be used as a temporary device, get us out of recession, go back to balanced budgets. Now that's just kind of gone out the window uh, with the U.S. especially. And now we're up to about 23 trillion. I mean, the numbers are just stagnant here. Yeah. And a lot of politicians now clamoring for power for the office uh, are espousing this modern monetary theory, if not saying it in, in verbiage, to the concept of just they can just pay for all these things without any ramifications for that. So. What is your opinion, Dr. Schiller, on that? Where's the end result of that? And is that yeah. a problem that we need to be concerned about? Uh, this uh, modern monetary theory, I've tried reading Stephanie Kelton and others. Uh, it's not uh, that crisp a, a theory to me. It seems to be, to me, to be related to a theory that was prominent in the Great Depression to justify their deficit spending called, we owe it to ourselves. 
actually some of us of ourselves owe it to others of us of ourselves, <laughs> and so they might not be happy with the outcome. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, that's. And I'll, I'll chime in while he's thinking some more. But when you think about it, too, the time period that Ms. Kelton uses in this is one of high bond yields. You know, you had you know you had uh, high nominal growth rates. So yields were coming down while growth rates were above that. And so, first of all, you have an intertemporal ma match because the GDP and growth is backward looking where inflation could be forward looking. As you borrow the debt today, you don't know what your growth rate looks like, right? Uh, but further to that, um, uh, at the end of the day, we found a new backstop and it's called the Federal Reserve. And so the question is, is that you, can, you, can you propagate this expansion of debt? The answer is yes. But what happens to the value of goods, right? And so ultimately, it either has to cause some form of inflation if you do a, a lot of spending, which we've already done the spending. So that's not the 23 trillion isn't going to cause inflation. We spent the money, right? That's already spent. You want to cause inflation? Put another 20 trillion on the books, okay? But also behind that is that you'll devalue the currency at some point. Right, and so that's if you've heard our views of being kind of medium term, kind of negative on the dollar, a lot of that comes from that. But I remember back in 2016, you know, many many years ago, feels like, and when they, I'm sorry, it was 2017, when they were putting together the tax reform bill, and you guys all participated in it. Thank you for paying your fair share of salt. Okay, but what happened? They didn't start with a baseline of we will not, we will be deficit neutral. They started with let's start with 800 billion. We'll, we'll accept that number. Now the number last year was north of 1.1 trillion. Was the death? Was actually Treasury net issuance. So we looked at that today. It's 1.1 trillion. That's not the deficit expansion because other things happened that were not forecasted, right? And some of those are, are bad events. So what you're talking about here is this reliance on the fiscal side, which is fine. We relied on monetary policy for so long, but the problem with it is, is eventually it will break. But if everybody does it then it's okay. As long as everybody does it globally, then we all devalue together. But at some point, um, it has to break. But we found a new backstop. And that's why modern monetary theory is very easily popular. One, you promise people goods. But also, you say, look, I, I, look, if I was running on the left right now, I think I could win very easily. Obviously, right? Why? I'd come out with a very th simple thing. You want to do MMT? Great. We're going to do it. You know what we're going to do? We're going to spend $4 trillion over my first four years of campaign. Why? Because we did it to the rich. It's a narrative. Okay? I'm not saying there's any truth in this. Who, you know, we, did, we did the balance sheet expansion. It's at $4 trillion. Now it was $700 billion before, so it's 3 3 expansion. Right? And what did you, Jane Main Street, get out of this? Nothing. I'm going to give you health care. I'm going to give you education. I'm going to make you great again. Very simple. Right? And who's going to buy it? The Fed. Why? Because they did it for the wealthy, they did it for corporate America, and you didn't participate. It's your turn. But that's all a narrative that I just spun right there. It's very simple, but I think that's dang popular. I like free stuff, don't you? And there's no ramification because we have a theory, right? So just because you put a theory on it doesn't mean it is one, um, and it'll work until it doesn't, right? So did you want to add anything? Uh, yes. oh, oh, I don't need you. You're hot. You've got a hot mic. <laughs> They try to shut me up, but see, I'm going to yeah. let them. I was just going to mention the Laffer curve, which is oh, yeah. in my book. Yeah. And Art Laffer, uh, the, 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 the narrative, you said you, you would win with this. I, I finally, I but think I, I win. I, okay, I, I believe you. But you believe that you, I think I win? You might win. <laughs> but you have to uh, make the narrative contagious. Sure. Uh, uh, you have to stand out among the 25 uh, Democratic <laughs> Party uh, candidates. And so it, it's the contagiousness of the narrative. So I'm thinking of the Art Laffer narrative. Uh, I can tell you the story again. It seems like a nothing story. It, Art Laffer was having dinner in 1974 with Donald Rumsfeld and um, Dick Cheney, big guys in Washington. And he drew a, di a diagram on the napkin that, uh, uh, that j justified the thought that cutting taxes might actually raise revenue. Uh, and, and that's the end of the story. Uh, why? That went absolutely viral. Uh, and the question is, why? Uh, there, I guess it's just a celebrity story. and It has kind of a nice way they put it, a neat little punchline. 
uh, and it just uh, it t took, took off. Now, so I, I have another little twist on the story, which I see suggested, and the, the, this, it's to make it dynamic, which he didn't do on his napkin. <laughs> but uh, when you cut taxes, it will stimulate economy with a lag mm -hmm. of uh, how many, five years, you were saying? I think it's five years. So, so that's the idea. So uh, you can get through your whole administration of four years yeah. with a deficit on the promise that your policy is going to put you back in surplus right. in five years. So that's a good, so you have probably uh, Art Laffer narrative, although we can't explain why, it is highly contagious with a little twist. So if we can somehow, if you for your campaign can somehow <laughs> add a little twist to it and put it in a joke forum or something, that uh, says that you've got four years' time now to come through with this. No, I mean, look, you say I wouldn't stand out. I think I would stand out amongst those 25 candidates. Come on. All right. So uh, again, thanks, everybody. We'll be here. Be kind to the professor. Don't accost him when we're here. Give him a fist bump. And let's uh, celebrate him being here today. Thank all of you for your support of Dubline. We really appreciate you taking time every day to come see us. And uh, let's have some cocktails. There's books in the back. The professor has been so generous to sign all of them for you. Please don't put them on eBay. If so, make sure you mail him the check for the proceeds, OK? Thanks again. Oh, oh sorry. Fist bump. All right.